We're talking about communication today. Communication is um, the imparting or exchanging of information or news. Is that a good general basic definition to work from? Yeah, it is. You know, communication is so, so important in building a healthy family dynamic. But can I just say something right from the beginning? That if you try to build or try to use everything that you would use ordinarily in a, in a, in a closed Christian environment with a blended family, extended family, where you have non-Christians and Christians, sometimes it's just, it does, it's not going to seem like it works. In other words, the things that I talk with non-Christians about, um, I, have to be, I have to be careful on how I say it because they don't understand it. And, and the reason I say that is because the Bible tells me that. The Bible says that to a non-Christian, someone that doesn't believe, has never received Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, they haven't had the miracle take place. See, the reason we know for certain that there's a God is because you know him personally. You know him personally. I was talking to some young guys out on the basketball court just this past week, and they go, no, nah, we don't believe. And I was witnessing to them. I was telling them about my faith. And they're like, I don't believe. And I said, I know for a fact there's a God. You can't know that. I said, you don't know what I can know. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? You don't know what I can know. I absolutely know that there's a God. And there's a, there's a, a wall plug or a plug right outside of the basketball court. I said, if you stick your hand in that plug, stick your finger in it, and I said, no, don't do it, because young people will do it. You know what I mean? <laughs> They'll do it. I said, no, no, don't do it. But if you did, you would know that the electricity's in there by the way you what? You feel. Guess what? When I gave my life to Christ, I knew for a fact there was a God because he came into my life the way the Bible says he would, and he radically changed me. He radically changed me. Let me ask you, have you ever experienced that amazing, more powerful feeling than even electricity of the Holy Spirit changing your life and your own personal miracle? If you have, then raise your hand. Just raise your hand. If you haven't, let me plead with you. Today is the day of salvation. Humble yourself. That was the best thing I ever did. I just humbled myself and I said, Lord, there has to be more to this life than what I've been experiencing. And he came into my life and he changed me from the inside out. He gave me new desires. He gave me new perspective. I could understand what his word was talking about. And so that's what I want to share with you. When, if you have a blended family, I'm talking about aunts and uncles, cousins, you know, and you get them all together, sometimes the conversation can get a little challenging. You know, we're in a, we're in a, we're predominantly Christian and, you know, we get a family member come over and they start talking about some really politically sensitive and charged stuff. And, and they're saying, you know, this is right and this is the way it is and this is the way it, it's supposed to be. And, and, and how do you think that goes? You know, I'm not looking at John because I'm like, John, John's feeling guilty over here. Let me go over, let me go over on this side. But what I'm saying is, how do you think that's going to go? Sometimes, you know, you have to understand that, um, that if, if your family's not Christian, then use these, these tools we're going to talk about here today to, to share the love of Christ. Share the love of Christ. But don't get discouraged if you have a scenario by which you go, it doesn't sound like Pastor Chris's family. And the reason it may not sound like my family is because my grandfather um, established a legacy. He was the first in our family to be Christian. But he became a pastor, and every one of his children are Christian. And they married Christians. And now my father's a pastor, and now I'm a pastor. And guess what? When we get together... It could be a very different dynamic than what you might be interest, uh, used to, excuse me, or want to see established. But you can be the legacy starter. 
Amen. You can be the legacy starter. So let me, let me say this. Uh, communication is also made up of a sender, a message, and a recipient. A sender, a message, and a recipient. It can be verbal or nonverbal. And the nonverbal part can include things like body language, facial expressions, physical touch. Come on, how many of you know you don't have to say a word to communicate love to your children? You can do it by hugging them, smiling at them, and communicating with your facial expressions, with your body language, and with your physical touch. As a matter of fact, I do that all the time with my daughters, with my son, and I would encourage you to, to go beyond just the verbal. But we also have to understand that there's bad communication, and bad communication is learned. It's learned. It's something that you pass on. So if you can pass on bad communication, then you can pass on what? Good communication, too. The problem is that if you've gotten into, uh, if, if you've been, if you've absorbed bad communication and you've brought it into your home, it can become a habit. And you can get into a rut. You know, what do you call a rut a rut? I mean, what does that mean, to be in a rut? Anyone ever heard that expression? Well, I was told it meant that when the old settlers went west, they would they would go on a trail, on a wagon trail, and eventually it would rain, and in the rain, the wagon would create these deep ruts, and when the hot sun would come out and bake it, that rut stayed there. And so the next wagon would fall into that rut, and it became like a train track, except in a rut instead of a track. And it was really hard to get your wagon out of there. Can I tell you, some of us are going to find it pretty hard to get our wagon out of the rut of bad communication. But here I want to share with you that if you want to learn good communication, there's two supernatural things you can put into practice. One of them is God's Word. This is not a normal book. This is a supernatural book. And I get it because if you're not a Christian, sometimes this sounds... And how many of you, when you weren't a Christian, this sounded like foolishness? I mean, Jonah and the whale? Are you kidding me? A talking snake and all of these different things, the splitting of the sea and the, and, and the giants and the this and the that. But it's, it's a supernatural book. And so when you put it, when, when you take it by faith and you put it into practice, it will change your life. It will change your life. And there's one more thing, the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we're talking about God's word and then the power of the Holy Spirit. Because if it's in your strength, you're, oh, I, I don't know, you may be better than me. But if it's left in my strength, I'm going to mess it up. Isn't that true? I'm going to lose my patience. I'm going to say things I shouldn't say. I'm going to feel what justified in saying those things. And I'm going to excuse myself. And I'm going to make excuses of it. I'm going to, I'm going to lash out at my kids. And I'm going, to, I'm going to act in a totally wrong way. And I'm going to say, I have a right to do so. But God's word reminds me, no, you don't. No, you don't. If God loved you, you also should love your family and one another. So let's get right into it. The, the most important thing this book tells us of is God's love. And so love is a big deal. You want to you wanna be a, you wanna have great communication in your family? Love. You go, well, pastor, duh, that's what everybody says. Even the world talks about love. But let's see what, God, uh, let's see what God's word says about this thing called love. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that's, the, that's the, the chapter known as the love chapter. But do you realize how Paul introduces that chapter? Go with me to the last verse of chapter 12. The last verse of chapter 12 says, but earnestly desire the best gifts. Now, where does that come from? Let me give you a little backstory. 1 Corinthians was written to a young church, a church that Paul during one of his missionary journeys, had established. So they were all brand new Christians. Paul hears, because it's been reported to him as, as he is their, their father in the Lord, so to speak, that they are having a lot of trouble. So you have a family dynamic having trouble. 
Come on, anyone know what I'm talking about here? That's not surprising, right? You get a bunch of people together, eventually they're going to have trouble. And one of the things that they're arguing about is what's more important, who's more important, what gift is more important. And so Paul is straightening out all sorts of problems. And he comes to this idea of gifts, and he says, stop arguing about the gifts. Let me share with you, the gifts are for the purpose of building up the church, so build one another up. And then he says, earnestly desire great gifts. That's good. You should desire to to use your gifts. But then watch what he says. And yet, I'm going to show you a more excellent way. Something that's greater than even just the gifts. What do you think he shows them? Well, the whole chapter, the next chapter that he just introduced is about love. And so he starts telling them all about love. Let me read to you just a couple of of, of selections. Love suffers long, or the way I learned it is, love is patient and love is kind. Love is patient and love is kind. It does not envy. It does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. Thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Why? Because God is love. And so if you learn to operate in love, then you're learning to operate like Jesus. But come on, how many of us know it's one thing to say, oh yeah, act like Jesus is another thing to actually do it, right? Every, anybody can say, yeah, act like Jesus. You first, <laughs> you know, that's tough. It's tough. Now do you know why you need a supernatural book and the supernatural power of this Holy Spirit, of the Holy Spirit? But, but, but stay with me on this. So then he finishes this chapter this way. And now abideth or abide faith, hope, and love. In one of your versions, you might read, and now remains faith, hope, and love. So if we were to boil this down to three things Paul is saying, the best three things you could major on are faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of those is love. So if you want to start on level one, start with faith. Level two is hope. Level three is love. Do you realize that's the way your Christianity Christianity should progress? You cannot know God without faith. The Bible says For by grace you have been saved through faith. Without faith, Hebrews says, you cannot know God. So there has to be some faith involved. But then this hope takes place. And then eventually love. Love. You're introduced to God's love. So so if that works for salvation, does it work for communication? I think it does. It does. I think it does. Listen to what the Bible says about faith, hope, and love. Therefore, having been justified by faith. What does it mean to be justified? I was guilty, but now Christ, in Christ, when I put my faith in Christ, he considers me what? Just. The slate has been washed clean when I trust in him. That's salvation. Watch. Faith. We have peace. You're no longer enemies of God. You are now at peace Through the Lord Jesus Christ, there is salvation in no other than who? I'm I'm just preaching Bible to you, straight up Bible. Because if you want to have a great family, you need to understand what? The Word of God. You need to understand the Word of God. I tell you, I would be in serious trouble without God's Word. But keep going, keep going. Through whom? Also, we have access by faith into grace. Remember, what is grace? Something you don't deserve, forgiveness. We don't deserve for heaven, but he gives it to us because of our faith. Watch this. And rejoice in hope. So now he introduces hope. And not that, but we also glory in tribulations. He goes on. Tribulation produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, character. Again, hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out into our heart by the power of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that what happens when we're saved? You put your faith in Christ. You are justified. You're at peace with God. And now you have this amazing hope. Not like, oh, I hope to have lunch with you. That means nothing. Right? I hope, you know, we should get together, Arthur, 
We've been saying that for two years. Come on, man, let's do it. Let's do it. You know what I mean? The, no, the hope that the Bible talks about is absolute certainty. And then he pours out the power of his Holy Spirit and you go, why are you going into so much of this? Because great communication starts with understanding. Understanding the greatest communication ever, and that's his word. His love letter to us. So keep going with me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to start running on this now. You ready? Are you ready? I've laid a foundation. Are you ready? Yeah. All right, here we go. Faith. Faith is trust. Trust. How important is trust in communication? How, how important is trust in a family dynamic? If you don't have trust, you're not going to have a very tight, knit, uh, loving, caring, united family front. You're just not. So trust is so important. Trust is honesty. Or what leads to real trust is being honest. The number one thing you can do in communicating with your family is always be honest. Now I can hear what you're saying. Oh yeah, I can be honest. I can be honest. They don't want me to be honest, <laughs> you know. Oh, I was honest the other day at, at, uh, at Christmas time when they came over. They hadn't been over since. <laughs> we'll talk. We'll talk more about this. Let's, let's, let's just go, go to God's word. What does God's word say? So stop telling lies. <laughs> let's just start with the basics, right? Stop telling lies. Um. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. Colossians says, don't lie to each other. Husbands, wives, the most important thing you can do is tell each other the truth. Because the ones that know the truth are your children, and if they see you guys being dishonest with one another, what do you think they're going to do? They're going to be dishonest with you. And then that starts a cycle of dishonesty. And if there's no trust, then you're never going to experience that closeness we so desperately want. That closeness where we can really believe each other. I'll tell you what, there was a, an incident when one of my roommates in college began to spread some lies about Pastor Melissa. I didn't know they were coming from him. And that supposedly she was going out with another guy while I was dating her. Or while we were, um, I was going to say engaged, but we weren't engaged yet. We were just boyfriend and girlfriend. And man, it was so hard to pinpoint and what was going on. And it was just, and it was coming from different places. And all of this kept stirring up. And let me ask you, when you feel you found the one and these lies start spreading, how does it make you feel? Oh, I was certain for a while. I was like, no, I'm certain. I'm certain that, that, that I can trust her, that, we're, that we're, um, we're meant to be together. But then it just got worse and worse and worse. And I'll never forget how I solved it. You want to know how we solved it? We started praying that God would give us wisdom. And the Lord told me, ask your brother Aaron, you guys never lie to one another. And so he didn't know it was bothering me that much and that, that all of this was taking place. I remember driving over to his place and, and where he was working, I said, Aaron, on your break, I want to talk to you. And so I sat down with him and I said, hey, man, this is what's happening. This is what's going on. I don't know if you know, but tell me the truth. And he said, it's coming from so-and-so. Now that you say that, I can remember hearing it and hearing this and hearing that, and there's a common denominator, and it's this person. I wouldn't lie to you. As soon as he said, I wouldn't lie to you, and he told me like that, I knew exactly, I knew for a fact who was saying it and that it was one big lie. How awesome is it to have brothers like that? Come on. Come on. How awesome is it to have brothers like that? How awesome is it to have parents like that, to have cousins like that, to have family like that where you know for a fact if they said it, then it's true. I'm telling you it can happen, 
But we have to understand that, that it doesn't happen if we don't value honesty. But this idea of telling each other the truth, well, I'm just going to tell the truth. And sometimes it hurts. But the Bible says always tell the truth in love. That means if you're telling the truth in love, you got to consider the how and the when and the where and the who's around. You've got to consider a lot of things because ultimately love, what, builds up. Love encourages. Love doesn't tear down. And so don't use that excuse that I just tell the truth. I just call it like I see it. No, the Bible says tell it in love. And so you have a responsibility to be a blessing. To be a blessing to your children. To be a blessing to your spouse. To be a blessing to your, to your, to your father, to your mother, to your extended family. See, ultimately, we're talking about the golden rule here. The golden rule is treat people the same way. Come on now. Treat people the same way you want them to treat you. That's the golden rule. It's, it's the ultimate expression of faith. Saying, Lord, I, I'm, I'm going to believe that. I don't have to get them before they get me. I don't have to treat them the way they treated me. That's the way the world does it. We're called to do it differently. See, what we're ultimately going at if we're building trust is we got to set up some boundaries. Now, I know boundaries are talked about a lot when it comes to relationships, but the boundary specifically that I'm talking about is things we should never say. Like, we got to have that deep in our heart. There's certain things we don't say. You know, you don't say certain things to your children. You shouldn't say, you're a loser, you're this, you're that, because you tear down trust, and once that word is out, you can't bring it back. Now, let me ask you this. How hard is it to build real trust? Let me ask you another question. How easy is it to tear it down? Is it easier to tear something down than it is to build it? And so what we're talking about here is set some parameters. Say, I never go here. Why? Because it will only tear down. You say, but, but why do people cross those lines? A lot of times people cross their li those lines because of hurt, insecurity, pride. Things that this book talks a lot about. A lot about. So stay with me on this. We're going to hope now. Hope, hope is about joy and happiness. Joy and happiness is super, super important. Super, super important. The Bible says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. Notice, believing is faith. Then you have hope. And hope is about what? Joy and happiness. By the power of the Holy Spirit. By the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to remind you of the verse in Romans that we just read. Here you have faith. Then you have hope. And that hope is brought about by the Holy Spirit. So you say, okay, okay, I'm supposed to have joy. Why is joy so important? Well, the Bible says, rejoice in the Lord always, not sometimes, all the time. And I want you to notice something else the Bible tells us here. He doesn't give you a suggestion. He gives you a command. It is commanded of us as Christians to experience joy, to experience joy in our hearts, in the way we talk to one another. Why is that so important? Well, just read a couple more verses with me. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And be glad in what? In the day that the Lord has made. Every day God has made, you have to rejoice and be glad in it. How about this? A joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. Can I tell you that's one of the hard, that, that's, that's something we have to understand. That if you're a Debbie Downer, nobody's going to want to be around you. Not even your family. If you're always negative, 
if you're always griping, if you're always just complaining, if you're always looking at the glass being half empty instead of half full, if you're always griping at your children, if you're always nagging your husband, I'm, I'm just saying for some of us, right? If you're always just constantly being something other than joyful, then how is that going to work in terms of having a good family dynamic where good communication is taking place? You know what, what, what I've seen? That you get good at being unjoyful. Gripey, mean, moody, complaining, and then someone with joy comes and tries to talk to you. Let's say one of your family members tries to talk to you. Let's say your daughter comes in and she's excited about what just happened at school. He, my son is excited about what just happened at school. Your, your granddaughter is happy about what just happened at Rush or something, and all they hear is griping, complaining, nagging, upset, bickering, let me ask you, are they going to talk to you? What are they going to do? They're going to say, oh, I'll tell you later. And they'll walk away and you'll never get that later. Communication is about a joyful heart. You know, that's one thing I can always say about my grandfather. He always had a joyful heart. He sang all the time. He was singing constantly. And his grandchildren, when we came over to his house, you know where we were? We were all around him. And he would be singing with us and playing the guitar and experiencing, we'd experience so much joy. We would share everything with him. Why? Because he would ask us a question and we felt that genuine concern and love and joy and we couldn't help but just talk to him. Do you hear what I'm saying? See, the Bible says if you want a friend, you got to show yourself friendly. How do you show yourself friendly? I, get, I guarantee you that one of the best ways to experience joy. Show joy. Show joy in your heart. It's a medicine that does you good, does the body good. Listen to what the Bible says. It says rejoice always. Every single day that God made, rejoice in it. It's a medicine to your body. The last one is count it all joy. Even when you're facing trouble and trials, Count it joy. Count it joy. Can I tell you, one of the hardest things to do is when you're down and your family's down. And I'm not just talking about husband and wife. I'm talking about the extended family here. When you're down, those that are younger in the family are watching you. Because they can feel the tension as well. When COVID hit. I remember my wife and I decided we're going to experience joy in the midst of this crisis. And I saw the reaction of my children. My children were looking at me and my wife. And as soon as we set the tone, then guess what happens? Then they relax and they start having a good time as well. And they'll literally say, I wish we could go back to COVID. And I'm like, uh, no. But what do they mean by that? That closeness, that closeness that sometimes is interrupted by the busyness of life, all of a sudden we were together. And some parents were saying, oh, I couldn't, I, I, I'm, I'm going crazy with my kids. I'm going, no, I love my kids. We're experiencing all this joy. Come on now. Come on, church. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you here? <laughs> love. Because ultimately what we're talking about is an optimistic attitude. Be like little Johnny. You say, little Johnny? Yeah, he's out there playing baseball by himself. And he throws the ball up in the air and he says, I am the best hitter in the world. Strike one. He's not daunted. He grabs the ball again. He throws it up as it's coming down. He's like, I'm the best hitter in the world. Base is loaded. End of the game. Strike two. 
He's still not discouraged. With joy in his heart, he jumps up, he knocks his cleats, he grabs the ball. I'm the best hitter in the world. Here comes the grand slam that's needed to win the World Series. Strike three. You think that would crush him? He sits there and he goes, what do you know? I'm also the best pitcher in the world. (laughs) You know, sometimes we got to be a little bit more like that. Amen? Amen? Say, nothing gets us down. Why? Why do you say that, Pastor? Why should we have that kind of joy? Why? Because if you truly have the faith that God has it, then you know the hope, the certainty that you don't have to worry about it. And you can talk to your kids and not have that, what? That that constant thing in the back of your mind where you're not even listening to what they're saying. You're not even listening to what your parents are saying. You're not even listening to what your aunt or uncle are saying or anybody that you're associating with in the family. Why? Or you don't want them around. I don't want them around. Why? Because I'm always stressed. I'm always stressed. I'm always stressed. No. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust in the Lord. Trust he's got this. All right, Kate, stay with me on this. Um, wow, I just lost my place. We're going to start over. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Love. We're almost done. Love. Love is patience and love is kindness. Love is patience and love is kindness. Listen, kindness is a lifestyle. I know there's a lot of talk these days about random acts of kindness, Those are cool. Those are awesome. Do random acts of kindness, but ultimately, kindness needs faithful practice every day. Not just once in a blue moon when you think of something, oh, I'm going to pay for somebody's Starbucks, but your family, you haven't done a single nice thing for them. (laughs) Right? That's what everybody always says. Oh, pastor, you'll never guess what I did today. I was at Starbucks, and somebody paid for my coffee, and I paid for the next guy's coffee. And I'm like, awesome. What'd you do for your wife? What is she doing? I turned this way. <laughs> Pastor Melissa's going, yeah, buy me a Starbucks. <laughs> no, no, it's not about Starbucks. It's about, it's about practicing kindness when? All the time. Because this is the way you're called to live. So it, pra- it requires practice. Kindness also requires intentionality. That means we need to have some forethought. Not only do we need to have some forethought in it, but kindness is not when we feel like it or a random act here and there when we happen to think about it. Or can I tell you something else? If you're so stressed and so busy, kindness is going to be the last thing you feel you have time for. So sometimes we have to stop rushing around, have eyes to see how we can help our family how we can be there for them, how we can invite them over and encourage them, how we can love on them, share a good report. Hey, they're going through a tough time. Can we sock away some money and bless them? They haven't been on a vacation in a while. Can we invite them with them? Can we do some things that will show the kindness Do you realize that when you're kind with somebody, how does it make you feel? It makes you feel amazing. And it opens up communication at a whole new level. A whole new level. Can I tell you something else? To love this way requires some discipline. And you have to learn to stir your heart to it. Last week, I was tired. I had a a tough weekend. I'm making excuses. You see how that goes? You start, you, start, you start building the case, and you build a case in your own mind. So I built that case, and I said, I've been, I've been working, I've been this, I've been that, and, and I'm really tired. And so Pastor Melissa said, hey, we're going to have family dinner, and, and these people are coming over. And, and what I mean by these people, like my kids, <laughs> you know, <laughs> my family's coming over. And I, re- I remember saying it. I remember saying, you know what? I'm tired. I'm always the one cooking. Come on, anyone ever talk like that? I'm always the one cooking. 
They want, so, they want to eat, and, and they say, oh, Dad, you know what? Why don't you make this, and why don't you do this, and why don't you do that? They need to get their little tails over here. And, and so I started kind of going down that road, John, and then I just sat down on the couch, and I said, I'm not doing a thing. It was right after church. I had preached three messages. Um, I think it was the day we had the wedding, too. We had a wedding after that. It was all these things. And Pastor Pastor Melissa says, well, I'm going to start getting ready, I guess, and clean up the kitchen by myself and put up stuff and mop the floors. And I said, that's what you want to do? Go for it. Knock yourself out. I ain't doing a thing. (laughs) Oh, don't act like you've even been there. (laughs) This is the flesh. It comes easy to us, Right? Selfishness comes easy to us. Uh, you know, that's why we need the power of the Holy Spirit. And I remember, you got to learn to, to, to read the cues, too. I said, is that okay? <laughs> what do you think she said? <laughs> you have the same problem. <laughs> oh, yeah, she, she said, yeah, that, that's fine. You go ahead. And I said, that's awesome. (laughs) Can I tell you, I averted disaster because I listened to the little voice inside that said, hey, you should get up because she's tired too. Why don't you do it together? Why don't you practice what you preach, son, and Who was that? Because that's kind of how I was like, who is that? No, he, he was loud and clear. He said, this is, this, is, this is the voice of, of reason, the voice of truth. And I can remember getting up, and she had already started to count the minutes she was, she was on the seconds of how long I sat there, and I got up as quickly as I could. Listen, what I'm trying to tell you, if you're going to love with, with patience and kindness and consideration, the way the Bible talks about loving, you're, you're going to have to have a tremendous self-control, especially when you communicate, because, because um, self-control is one of the fruits of the Spirit. If you read the list in Galatians, Starts off with love and ends with self-control because because it really does require a lot of self-control in a family dynamic not to respond out of frustration, insecurity, disrespect, or unforgiveness. Isn't that the truth? Forgiveness. What do we mean by forgiveness? Get rid of all bitterness, the Bible says, rage, anger, rash, uh, harsh words, and slander as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted. Notice what's happening. Paul is giving you a mouthful here, guys. Notice what he's saying. Look, get rid of bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, slander, and all kinds of evil behavior. He sums it all up. Instead, be kind to each other. That's love. And in order to have this kind of love, you need to have a soft heart. You know what hardens the heart more than anything? If not, unforgiveness. And if we're talking about families, that's where we're tested the worst. Inside the church, our family, well, so-and-so did this, I'll never forgive them. Or I'll forgive, but I won't forgive. Yeah. Well, if you don't forget, it just keeps, the enemy just keeps bringing it up over and over and over. What if the Lord said that? What if the Lord said, I'll forgive you, but I'll never forget? Instead, the Bible says the exact opposite. He says, I forgive you, and I plunge it in the deepest sea, separate it like the east is from the west, and I remember it never again. Never again. And that's the way we're to love one another because it affects the way we talk. It'll be hard to be kind and to be generous and to be uplifting and to have these amazing conversations of closeness with your spouse, with your children, with your parents, with your aunts, with your uncles, with whoever, if you have that 
unforgiveness in your heart. Respect. Respect. Respect in the, Old, in the New Testament is used quite often. It means honor and value. Honor and value. And the Bible says that we are to respect one another in the way we talk to each other. Now, I covered an entire message on this pretty much on Sunday. Please listen to that if you haven't, uh, if you weren't able to listen to it. But ultimately, I want to talk about fear, and this is where we finish, fear. Fear is where I talk about insecurity. Because when you're fearful, you're not going to be able to communicate and have that, that open confident communication. Insecurity gets in the way. And you say, so what kind of, what kind of, uh, what's the difference between confidence and insecurity? Well, insecurity is just plain fear. And it manifests in seven basic ways. You could probably make a list of a hundred basic ways, but, but I, I just want to highlight these. Insecurity is when you feel jealous of others' success. Now think about this. If you're in a family situation and you have a brother, a sister, an aunt, and uncle, a cousin, whoever, or even your own spouse that's having success and you have this insecurity, how are you going to feel? Like, I don't want them around. You're going to communicate jealousy. You're going to try to one-up each other. It's going to tear down the beauty of the family. And you say, why is this important? Because this is why it's important. If Melissa and I don't teach our children not to be insecure, then we have three of them. What happens when they take on spouses and they have their own families and we try to gather them if they're feeling jealous? Come on, tell me. They're going to fight. They're going to avoid each other. They're going to be snippy with each other. They're going to respond to one another out of jealousy, trying to tear each other down so they can one-up one another. They're always going to be, and, and this is something that's super, super important. Learn it now. You say, but, but I don't have a family like yours. It's, I'm, I'm, a, I'm the lone person. Are you part of a bigger family? Are you a part of a church? Do you find yourself being the person that's jealous? What responsibility do you have to take care of that? They, see, they secretly want others to fail. That goes with the same thing. They always blame others. And so become defensive. They have trouble saying no. This is super, super important because if you can never say no, no, then you'll never be able to say yes to the best things. And a family needs quality time if you're gonna if you're gonna grow a good, awesome family. Let's keep going. They constantly worry about the future and they need constant affirmation. If you're here, then maybe. You know, you can, you can pray and say, Holy Spirit, help me with this fear. I don't want to have this kind of fear. This is called the fear of man instead of the fear of God. The fear of God will bless your life. That's called true confidence. True confidence is fearing God. How so? Well, the Bible says this. In the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence. Isn't that true? I'm going to explain it in just a second. And his children will have a refuge. Let me read another thing, uh, another verse for, from Hebrews. So we cannot, uh, so we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. Notice, I fear the Lord. Therefore, I don't run from him because that's the wrong kind of fear. The holy fear of the Lord says, I'm not going to be away from him. I want to get as close to him as possible. And when I get close to him, then he what? He helps me and he protects me. And he is a strong tower and a refuge. He hides me under his wings. Whom shall I fear? 
And so you start to gain confidence. Why? Because when I pray, he's there. When I ask for guidance, he shows me. He illuminates things to me. I don't have to be jealous of somebody else because what's for me is for me. And the Lord has told me, no one can take it from you. Because when I give it from my hand, no one can steal it. No one can steal it. Therefore, I don't have to be jealous of my brother. I don't have to be jealous of my uncle and my cousin and my aunt and my niece and my I don't have to. Why? Because the Lord is my provider. And he is my Jehovah Jireh, the the God who provides for me. There's a confidence there. Guys, listen. Being confident of this, of this very thing, that he who began the good work is faithful to complete it, it will change the way you live when you say, Lord, I'm not going to be fearful of you in this sense that I run from you. I'm going to be fearful in the sense that I run to you. I don't want to be out there ignoring you. I don't want to live like you don't exist. I'm going to humble myself. The other day, I was praying to God for, well, shoot, I must have prayed about 20 times for all kinds of little things. And I said, Lord, I'm losing it. I said this, by, by, the, by the end of that, I said, I'm losing it. I got to ask you to help me find my keys. I got to ask you to help me with this. I got to ask you to help me with that. And I listed them all. And I said, I feel like I should stop bothering you so much. He said, now that's funny. In my heart, I felt this. I felt like like I just had this thought, like that's funny that I think I'm a bother. You you must be elevating yourself a little bit much, Chris. I got no problem with that. And then I was reminded of the verse that we preached on last sermon series, which says, pray without ceasing. Whatever you need help with. I want to hear it. Come on now. I want to hear it, he says. He's telling you the same thing. Have confidence that who, the one that began the good work, he's faithful to complete it. It'll change the way you talk to people. And ultimately, it'll lead you to true holiness. This is where I finish. True holiness. Watch this. Watch this. By the fear of the Lord, one departs from evil. When you fear God, you say, I don't want to do the things that non-Christians do. What does that have to do with building a good family and the way you communicate in your family? You know, the worst times in my life have been when I'm carrying guilt and shame. And I'm usually carrying guilt and shame when I'm out doing stuff I shouldn't be doing. And it impacts the way I talk to those around me. And the people that are around me the closest are my family. Anyone hearing me? When you walk in holiness and you feel the presence of the mighty God and you feel his his good pleasure, Not that you're perfect, but you're not out there engaging in sin that you know you shouldn't be engaging in. You're walking with a clear conscience, so to speak. How is that going to impact the way you talk? How's that going to impact the way you engage your loved ones? Oh, it'll change everything. This is where we finish. Walk in holiness. Faith, hope, and love. You say, well, wait a minute, Pastor. Walk in holiness. Yeah, that's what the Bible says. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. But, but that you're right back to that, that, that hard thing. To walk like Jesus is hard. Didn't I tell you that you, you need the Bible and the Holy Spirit? Watch what Jesus says after this. If you love me, keep my commandments, verse 16. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you a what? An advocate to help you. 
Who is that advocate, that helper? The spirit of truth. For he lives with you and will be. How did we start? Some of us need to put our finger in the light socket again. <laughs> you, you, you remember the analogy? How do I know there's electricity? How do I know that the Holy Spirit, you surrender? And we just need to surrender our communication to him and say, Lord, help me. Amen, help me. Help me speak life. Help me speak life. I love you, church. Um, we have time to do question and answer. Come on, baby. Let's do this. You guys ready? You okay? Are you tired? Are you like, I'm done? I gave you a lot. Do you have them? Those are some questions that Cody gave me. I don't, don't know where he got them. I, mean, I think I know where he got them, but... <laughs> I think he got them from you guys, is what he told me. Gosh, there's so many good communications on here, uh, questions on here about communication, but um, here goes one, Pastor. I feel like my spouse and I communicate well, but don't communicate effectively and with purpose. For example, we listen to each other and don't argue, but we don't listen to each other and talk everything out. How do we change our mindset? Ooh, yeah, you started with the big one. Um, <laughs> we, we communicate, effect, I, I think they said we don't argue. They don't argue, they talk, but they but don't talk things out. they're not talking things out with purpose. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times, um, that's, that's a habit that's taken place, and it can happen once your children move out of the home because you start to feel that, well, my purpose is over, but your purpose was never just to raise good children. Your purpose was to raise a man or a woman, depending if you have a girl or boy, and then to be a great grandfather, grandmother, and to get involved in your grandchildren's life, and to get involved in God's kingdom. God's kingdom. Do you realize that, that the Bible speaks more of the kingdom of God than it does of the, new, of the family, of the extended family? So if you've raised children and you're looking for purpose, engage God, because purpose is what lights the fire. Remember what Paul tells uh, Timothy and, and the churches that he writes to is stir up passion, stir up passion. Um, and so you can actually pray, God, give me a pure and holy passion for your name, for your house, for your kingdom that I can see clearly as a couple, as we can see clearly what you have us to do in this next, in this next season of our life. Because then that will create a need for, for communication, not just what are you going to eat today or what are we doing, what are we watching tonight? You know, that, that's not, that, that's, that's the little stuff. You got to have the big, the big purpose going for you. Does that make sense? I hope I answered the person's question who sent it in. And I think a lot of people, Pastor, if I can just um, add to that, I think sometimes we don't like talk things out because we know what has happened in the past when we've talked things out. It's like, oh, I don't want to go there because I'm going to be like, Whoo. We're going to have it out. And um, I think that that's why the tools you gave tonight are so important because forget the past, you know, just look forward. And we can't be responsible um, for good. somebody else, but we can be responsible for our own actions. And so I think that if we learn how to communicate with love and respect and honor, then our spouse may not do it at first. Our friend may not do it at first. But eventually, I think they're going to notice like, hmm, Despite what's happened in the past, she, she's coming at me in a different way, and I got to give it to her. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a little more willing to listen, and that can start opening that door to building so communication true. again. So here's another one uh, for you. How, um, how do I have transparency within the family without causing disrespect or initiating an argument? Ooh, how do we have transparency within the family without... Um 
causing an argument or being disrespectful, first of all, I think we do have to consider the, the when, the where, the, the how. You know, for me, if I'm dealing with my children, I have to be very careful not to do it in a way that would embarrass them in, 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 in front of company. Um, that's something that I've grown in uh, because I want, I want my children to trust me. And so I find the time to say, hey, I want to talk to you, especially as my son has gotten older, as my daughters have gotten older. We find the right time, and we have family meetings. And I've created a dynamic by which at the family meeting we can, we can bring up the hard stuff. And so we don't do it just at the dinner table because the dinner table is supposed to be a place of joy, you know, a place of, of joy and laughter and fun. And some people bring up the hard stuff at the dinner table and then it creates, every time people go to the dinner table, they're like this. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so we do that at a family meeting and now people, you know, sometimes they come to, when I go, hey, family meeting guys, they're like, okay. But I want them to be like, okay, dad's about to share some, some hard stuff. Now, you might say, what if it pertained to my parents? I'm going to add different dynamics. My dad, you know, um, I have to respect him, so I have to be very careful and prayed up if I bring anything up to him at all. Because he's, he's God's son, not my son. And so I'm very, very careful and honoring of him if I bring something up. And... Uh, and if I don't, it will definitely end up in an argument. Yeah, <laughs> I can understand that. It's hard when, you, when you're talking to somebody who, you know, like you value them in that way. So I think that is important. So praying about it. I think just praying about talking with our kids, too, is important, even though we're in that role and God has assigned us that position to care for them and love them. We still should be prayed up. And so I'm just going to add that to that. When you and I, lots of times when we are discussing or we feel led by the spirit to do something sometimes we will have that family meet together first and then at times I'll be like okay I feel, I'm going to go talk to Evelyn or I'm going to go talk to Raquel about this because maybe it just is received a little bit better from mom but we're still in agreement about that we still pray together about that and then I have that conversation with them and lots of times I just want to say this at those family meets when we're like all together and and I want to encourage you have family meetings to discuss hard things because I think that you love and you, you know, we love and we live together as a family and families for one another. And so when we have a big family meet in our, in our living room, one thing that's important to remind our kids, even though we've developed this and nurtured it and care to have an atmosphere that, um, good communication occurs, we sure. still say, because we're all human, we still are going to feel insecure at times, especially when you're going to address something that may be hard to deal with, to remind your kids, to remind each other, we're for you. Like, we're telling you this because we love you. Don't get all, like, bent out of shape. Don't feel like we're trying to discourage you, shame you, hurt you. We're telling you this because we love you. And, and having that conversation with, like, all the siblings and mom and dad is so important. Because then as they get older and they get married, like you were talking about, Pastor, and they have those conversations as adults, siblings as adults having those conversations, they're going to remember that their you know, brother or sister are telling them that because they love each other. And that's how you continue to build that legacy. Okay, here's I'm going to give you another dynamic because some of you might be thinking it's all related to the you know, nuclear family of having kids. And, but but I, I try to give you the dynamic of me and my dad. Maybe me talking to him. I'm going to share with you my father-in-law talking to me. Um, even though I may, have those meets too, right? And there. It, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's been plenty of times where Lewis is, will say to me, um, and he always, I, I can tell. I, I, I've, I've, I've grown up around him now 30 years, and he'll say, hey, Chris. I'm like, okay. <laughs> he goes, uh, hey, Chris, uh, son, I want to talk to you. And then... I'll say, yes, sir. And so it requires, again, adherence to God's word, humility, saying, yes, sir. And there's been some times where I've gotten a little charged and he's been wise enough to say, I just want you to hear me and we can finish later. But most of the time I, I try to, I, I receive it. 
I receive it, Father-in-law. And I'll say that. I receive it. I know his heart. I know I can trust him. I mean, I, I can trust him with my life. And that's something that's built. It's not something that you just accidentally get. It's something that he has always shared with me advice based on his love for me and my family. And he's got room to advise me on my kids. So he's told me more than once, I think you're being a little hard on, or I would like for you to consider this, or I think you're missing this. And I'll say, yes, sir. And I pray about it. And I would say nine times out of 10, you're right, Lewis. I mean, pretty much. And so uh, I think that's, that's important. And that's, I think, what we should have, isn't it? Do you, do you feel like that's a good thing? Yeah, I mean, that's why I'm here. I want him to be involved in raising my children. And I can't tell you how many times he's saved me from having hard conversations. Because my children will come back and say, Dad, I'm sorry. Grandpa talked to me and I can see what I was doing. And I'm like, good. Good. (laughs) That's so good. Um, Here we go. Here's another one. I want to have a healthy relationship with my friends who don't have spouse. Um, but how can I do this effectively without causing them to feel lonely due to me having a spouse? Oh, get Does rid that... of your spouse. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, but that's kind of what it sounds like. You know, it's like, I want to make my friends feel good, but I've got this spouse with me. <laughs> Come on, marriage is a good thing. Amen. And, uh, you know, single, uh, anyone who's single can always hang around us, but I'm not going to apologize for my marriage. It's a gift from, my, from God, and I, and I love you to get excited about it, and we'll pray that you get a marriage too, and, and uh, you can get inspired by our marriage. And that's kind of the way I look at it. You know, I don't really... Oh, I can, I, I can think of some situations, though, Pastor. Like, like what? <laughs> like, I guess I'm just I guess, okay, because it's happened with us. Because it's happened with us. Because I've had friends who, um, who were, I'm good friends with them, but they're not married. And they're always wanting to, like, hang out or talk. Maybe it's not because they're always wanting to every day, but we're in, uh, maybe we're, we're serving or we're doing a mission trip or we're, you know, at an event, and they're oh, talking. Because yeah. I know yeah, I you know say, mean. like, dang, you know, babe, come on, like, tell her, we got to have our time. But That's how you handle that, it. <laughs> but how do you communicate like, that nicely? I, I, and I would say this. I'm going like, to ask this my own question. Our date night, no. <laughs> but I think that that's important. Like, we, we are not always going to be, you know, we're going to have friendships with different people, but I think boundaries and telling that person like I had to tell my girlfriend I love you I care for you but look I have you know my my husband it's God and then my husband and then my kids so let's spend some time together that's when you beat your you're having that healthy communication you're telling him or, or her what what your expectation is not that I hang out with him so I don't I just yeah. hang out with hers <laughs> but I'm telling you if you're a guy you may need to do the same thing because guys can be kind of clingy too and lonely when your spouse is wanting to spend time with you too but this is the thing have that communication with them tell them in other words set clear boundaries have clear expectations and then if they're really a friend they will understand and value that because to be a good friend you have to respect your friendship you have to have that's boundaries, a really good point. and that's important you you because respect your you can't have unhealthy expectations, and you have to communicate that. We're actually going to cover expectations because um, in, in in one of the uh, the sessions that we still have, so we'll cover we'll come back to that. But I also think it 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 does require, and and it brings up an interesting mm-hmm. point that sometimes guys and gals are a little different in their communication styles because sometimes Pastor Melissa. We'll be struggling on how to wordsmith everything. And I'm just like, you know, guys are just a little bit more clear. Like, dude, don't be weird. You know, <laughs> don't, don't be weird. You know, this is our time. And, and, and there's something to be said for that. Am I right? 
I mean, sometimes you have to be a little straightforward, and, and that's part of developing that real trust, that real trust and love and care, because if they know you love and care, oh, sorry, babe. I think that's her way of saying, be quiet. <laughs> Who's the nice one now? Yeah, who's the nice one now? Okay, here's another one. My children are currently um, my children are currently living in the world. How do I communicate to them the importance of living a Christ-like life and a life not of this world? Ooh. I'm gonna give you a time limit, Pastor, on this one because this is hard. But no, I'll give you the one-word answer. Pray. pray. I mean, pray. You, and what I mean by pray is because th- this is what we're talking about here, guys. Um, I saw a quote from an atheist the other day, that, and, and it was, um, I'm, I'm not going to quote it verbatim because it's quite lengthy and I don't, I don't have a photographic memory, but it basically said this. I don't respect Christians who say they believe but then don't do anything to share that belief. I respect Christians that if they really believe that there's a hell and someone is going there, that's like a truck coming at someone and they're about to die. They should do everything they can to tackle that person and to share their beliefs with them. If they truly believed it. And I kind of I feel like that's what parents should do. Not go tackle your kids, but pray like, like, like there's, I mean, just pray like you've never prayed for something before. And when you believe that God is real and that God says, I will save you and your house, then it shall be done and it is done. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And so, um, yeah, pray. Pray and have faith. I'm going to add that because we were just talking about that this mom, like you were, you know, pastor is pretty transparent. He was a tough child to deal with from young. (laughs) You were challenging with your parents, but I was just commending and just saying how much, um, I value you and respect your mom because she prayed, but she also had the faith to put you in God's hands and trust that God was going to get a hold of you. And I think lots of times we pray as parents, but then we get up from our Her prayer quiet was place. very, very, very scary. Yeah, and then we get up from that quiet place with the Lord where, where we're asking and we're seeking him out. And then we, again, start to try to take action ourselves. And your mom didn't. She just prayed and had that faith and trusted you to the Lord. And then she told me straight up what mm-hmm. her prayer was. She said, I'm praying that you will come back to the Lord even if it's in a wheelchair. But you will come back. And I was like, Mom, what are you doing? Stop that, you know. Um, so I decided. There's easier you know, ways to do live yeah. life. There really is a better way. Is that where you got that from, I think, at that moment? All right, here. Here's a good question. I have adult children that I still parent. I've come across many challenges with this. How do I successfully parent without causing friction? So I guess the child is still living in the house, yeah, maybe. Yeah. No, I mean, we had, we had similar things um, as well. And I mean, Raquel was an adult child when she was still in our, in our home before she got married. And uh, I'm a little different in this regard. Um, wow. I think it depends on every child. My child, I, I knew they were, she's motivated. She's always been a, a, an achiever and she likes to please. And so I, I just have always told my children, you're welcomed as long as, as you need to be here. I love you. I'm in no hurry to kick them out because every day with them is a blessing. But I can understand that if you have a child that's not motivated, um, that can actually work against you. <laughs> and, and so um, for us, that, that's the conversations we've always had and we've always said, hey, you know who we are. And so church is, is an absolute must. Involvement in church is an absolute must. 
and following our guidelines is an absolute must. And other than that, um, but we have a very different dynamic than I think a lot of people do. Because, like, my kids don't take their phones in their rooms. They don't eat in their rooms. They don't have televisions in their rooms. They don't have computers in their rooms. So they're with us. Literally, they, we spend time together. And if my son comes in like he did last night, and the first thing he wants to do is talk, but that's what he does. That's what Raquel, I mean, Evie did. That's what Raquel does. We would just sit around and talk. So I turned the, I turned the television off immediately, and we sat and talked for an hour. And that's routine, routine. So as he becomes an adult, I'm having so many conversations with him about, you know, what do you sense God is telling you, son? What do you want to do? What, what do you, and so we had a conversation about what he felt God was leading him towards, not to go to college right, right now, but maybe in a year. In the meanwhile, he wants to try a couple things, and he shared that with me, and, and, and I think it's a good idea. And so we're talking about that. My, and I told him my worst year of college was my freshman year. So, yeah, maybe you should get, get a little grown up and then, and then go, or, or we'll talk about it. But, but I think that's the, that's the key is to have conversation that's open, clear, heartfelt, uh, loving, caring, considerate, kind, um, and straightforward. Yeah, and I don't think you ever stop parenting. I mean, you never stop parenting. Now, I think some people think, like, would they, when they become 18 or as soon as they graduate high school, whew, I'm done. But, but that's not the attitude we should have. I think the attitude we should have is we continue to invest in our children and our families. That's how you build the legacy. Um, and, I, and I just want to say one thing. I think lots of times it's hard when we talk about things. I liked what you said. It was like, you know, we, our family is very different because we have been intentional about, you know, putting the Lord first. As for me, my house, we will serve the Lord. And for some of you, when I hear you guys just sharing with me your hearts and asking me questions, it's like, how do you do that? You just start, just start. And it may feel really awkward at first. And it may not go over well or it may not be what you anticipated it being, but just do it. And the more you do it, the more you'll get better at it. And so I think that's the key is just to start. Hey, can I just say this? And, and I'm, I'm, we're, we're, our time is up. We're right at 830 and 830 we're letting y'all go. But if you have grandchildren and, and children, you have to be so vigilant over their phone. I mean, some of your own kids have asked me questions about, about witchcraft, about really pagan, demonic stuff, and they're getting it on their phone. They're getting it online. And so, you know, that kind of dark stuff leads to um, serious challenges. And, and that's why I'm, I'm saying, like, like, Man, communication. Get in there. Don't don't let anything turn that TV off. Turn your phone off. Children come in, put your phone down. Be open. Turn the TV off. That way they come in and they're like, why'd you turn the TV off? No, what's going on with you? And then they get used to talking to you. And they'll start telling you. They'll recap their day. And so and so did this and so and so did that. Oh my gosh, that's so funny. Oh my what did you say? And you can gauge what they're saying. If they say something crazy, then you take a note and say, I got I to gotta re reinforce some stuff here. That was crazy. <laughs> you know? And so, um, can I pray over you? Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you so much for this beautiful day and for this beautiful night. We rejoice and we're glad in your word and your spirit, Lord, and we ask that you would guide us. Guide us in this uh, beautiful thing that we get the privilege of doing, and that's, uh, that's raising a family for your glory and for your honor. It's tough in this environment, Lord, but I know that you are greater still. And so, Lord, I pray that you would infuse every heart here today with courage and confidence, that you would... Um, just help them know that you're for them 
And if you're for them, no one can be against. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you, church.